everybody. This is a, a little bit more technical of an audience than I usually speak to, so I want to invite you to think of this talk in a couple of ways. Number one, I hope you like the cover, too. Um, one way to think of it is uh, just scaling way back or looking, you know, going way up to a higher altitude about what's going on as a reminder to all of you that you're living the future already, you're building the future already that most of the world is still trying to catch up to. So let's have a hand for you guys. Hello. <laughs> I, I think you should be very proud of what you're doing because you're building the future. Um, number two, uh, I'm not sure if this stuff is going to seem obvious to you or not because this, I'm describing what you're building every day. Um, but I would invite you also to think of this as a way to tell your story to the business side. And if I can give you ideas that will help you make your case better, your business case better, um, that's the audience that I usually talk to is the business people. So let's go on from there. So we're building a global network. We've talked about that. I thought Tim O'Reilly gave a great talk about that yesterday. Um, here's something that's happening on the business side. Uh, the asset profitability, which basically means return on assets, return on physical stuff that you buy, is plummeting. It has been for 50 years or so. Uh, meanwhile, manufacturing has sort of plateaued as a percentage of the economy, and where most of the growth is happening is in services. We all know that, and we talk about service-oriented architecture. I don't need to explain that to you. I think some people think that what's happening is a result of manufacturing going overseas to other countries, but this, this uh, percentage of the economy based on services is really going up everywhere. It's not just in the US, it's happening everywhere. This is a global phenomenon. It's similar to the Industrial Revolution of the 1850s or so, where agriculture, you know, primarily agricultural uh, population started working in factories. And we're, we're having a very a similar revolution today. Power is shifting from the companies to the customers. I can get on Yelp or whatever. I can complain. All kinds of cracks are happening in the foundations of, of the large companies, the things that were hidden before. Uh, Jeff Bezos uh, talks about, you know, used to be a uh, upset customer would tell five friends, now they'll tell 5,000, right? We know that. Customers are connecting, the businesses are having trouble adapting. Bottom line is, what's happening is, there's a huge rise in complexity in the business environment. Um, services tend to sprout up around products. So for every product, there's probably 100 services. That's one of the reasons for this. Um, products are increasingly, with the Internet of Things, becoming avatars for a service. They're a piece of a thing that a service is built around. And we can think about, you know, people can think about an iPhone or, you know, a tablet as a, pro as a product. Really what you're buying is a store that allows you to buy all the services. That's why Kindle is giving their stuff, almost giving their stuff away. Um, so I think one thing that's important to think about or to understand about this shift is we're going from thinking of businesses as relatively co closed systems like a watch, you know, closed, everything's protected inside, and you can get to design the whole thing. And that's how we've designed companies for the last 100 years, to an open system where everything, like a, a natural system, where everything can't be enclosed and encapsulated. So factories are like watches. Factories do better when they're isolated from their environment. You can control everything inside. You can design everything. And these are the organizations that a lot of us, I think, still work in. Now, our problem is that services do better when they cluster together. You know, you go to the shopping mall, you don't want to just go to one store and then go to another store. You want all that stuff to be there. See a movie and then go out for beer, right? All that stuff. And that's what's happening with services as well. We've got the App Store, the Enterprise App Store, which is kind of going to be the next uh, big thing in the enterprise, I think. And from a business perspective, we're moving from thinking of things in a linear way, you know, step by step by step by step, to having to think about things in a very complex and nonlinear way. So instead of a line of production, we're moving to almost a line of interaction. It's almost like a weather front. Is that making sense? Okay. Preaching to the choir. <laughs> Problem of scale. 
you always have to, this, this basically balances as you try and increase, uh, as you try and increase the number of people in a company, you're adding more bureaucracy and controls, and this happens with IT as well, and all that stuff that you add to try and control and manage stuff decreases your productivity. So you're less productive per person. So think, look, the, the picture on the left here is as companies grow in size, as companies get bigger in terms of the number of employees, the productivity per person drops dramatically. Okay, so you see like on the far right of that left-hand graph there, it might be a company like Walmart. Lots and lots of employees, very low productivity per employee. But here's what's interesting. As a city is an open system, most companies operate as a closed system, but a city is more of an open system. As you add more people to a given you know, square mile area, as you, as you increase population density, productivity goes up. So what's going on there? I think this, there's a parallel to what's going on in, in business. Right? It's like, think about it this way. As you add more apps to the app store, right, it becomes more interesting. Services do better when they cluster together. Um, this gets us into you know, sort of the science of complexity, where people are studying things like brains and traffic and ant colonies, and the basic concept is, in a complex adaptive system, you have many agents interacting. They could be people, they could be services, they could be devices. You have some kind of scarcity of resources. Attention is one today, right, scarcity. And you have feedback and memory, so the system is continuously learning and co-evolving. Everybody's upgrading and everybody's having to keep up with each other's upgrades, et cetera. A city is a really good way to conceptualize a complex system, right? Because nobody's scheduling all the trucks that go into New York City every day to deliver apples and pears and food and pieces of stuff, right? There's no master planning commission that's planning all that stuff. It's happening by the agents interacting. This is what's happening, this is what we're doing today, what you're doing in the, in the, in the app world today. And this is the way that we're managing that today. Okay, this is typical, you know, this is the industrial age corporation designed by du DuPont and the uh, Alfred Sloan at General Motors. This is not a kind of organization that's designed to handle complexity. It's designed to pump out a lot of stuff that's identical. It's like a watch, it's designed like a watch. So what does a company look like, an organization that's designed to handle complexity. It looks, this is my drawing of it. <laughs> um, you have some set of organizing principles that holds the company together, some set of, some kind of purpose. You have some core functions, standards, protocols, etc. And I call this podular or connected company. And you have pods. You have basically holistic. Uh, businesses within the business that can operate and are, are designed to handle and absorb different kinds of complexity. This is the design by division. This is the one that we're mostly still living in that we're trying to transition out of, right? We have the division of labor, division by task, by job, function. And what does that drive? That drives a sort of territorialism, right? Raise your hand if you've run into territorialism in your company. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have these processes, and they kind of go across the silos, right? Separate tasks. And what does process lead to? I give, I give you a hint there. At least a dogma, rigidity, brittle. It becomes brittle over time. Um, so what's a design for connection look like? Well, think about a city plan. You're making connections. You're, and what WSO2 is doing that I think is so amazing is you're building this, really this plumbing, this electrical infrastructure, this water, the pipes, you're building this stuff that's basically gonna, people are gonna build cities on top of. People are gonna build connected companies on top of the stuff that you're building. They may not know that yet. They will have to get there though. They will have to get there because there's no other way to handle complexity. Um, standards, standard protocols, shared services. What kind of behaviors happen in these, in cities, right? Flocking, people, co-working spaces, things like that. Um, shared services. I know when I have, as long as I'm in the U.S., I know that the plug on the end of my laptop 
is going to plug into a wall. That's a standard, right? It's a shared service. I know that stuff's going to work. It's, like an a it's just an API, isn't it? I mean, I'm not a technical person, but that's an API, isn't it, sort of? <sighs> okay. Processes are brittle. They are linear. So a process is like a chain. It's only as strong as its weakest link. Pods or collections of pods are networked. So when one goes down, it doesn't have to bring everything else down with it, right? You have other pieces, services. So think of a pod, and where I'm going with this is business, you, you, you uh, in the technology world, you are ahead of business people in terms of managing and dealing with complexity. You know stuff, now you may not be always speaking the same language or using the same terminology, but you know stuff that they don't know yet. And what's gonna happen is businesses are gonna have to, in order to survive, re-engineer along the lines of the same kinds of way that services are organized right now. Service-oriented architectures, although no, that's, I guess that's a little bit of a dirty word, I should maybe say, should I say API management? But think of a pod as like a service, except it's made out of people, okay? It's a semi-autonomous unit, has control of its own fate, hides complexity, et cetera. A platform is a support structure that increases the effectiveness of that community. We talk a lot about platforms. Platform is a support structure. It says what you can and can't do, right? So think about, you know, part of a platform in a city is what side of the road do people drive on? You know, that, that is, if everyone has to agree about that, right? There are rules, there are lines on the road. Here's where you can park. Here's where you have to pay to park. The thing on the left here is kind of the old way, where com customers coming to a company have to map to the way that the company does business. But we're, we're inverting that, aren't we? Because now we have to map to the customer. We have to actually conform to the way that they want to do things. And the companies that don't do that are the ones that either have a monopoly or some kind of, you know, uh, politicians in their pockets, or uh, they're going to die. Customer service in a divided company. This is a great way to piss off your boss, your business people, tell them they work in a divided company. But they do. This is what happens, right, when you call in, phone company or whatever, you go through the voice menu, you hit numbers, you get the recording that says your call's important, which is so ironic. Uh, <laughs> you, you get the person, but it's the wrong person. You have to re-give them the information that you already typed in on your phone. Then they give you another person, but you basically are bouncing around because the company has no way to deal with you as a human being. You're conforming, you're having to conform to the company's service because everything the company has done from a design perspective has been to optimize their internal efficiency. They've done nothing to optimize efficiency for you. And what happens when you optimize for internal efficiency? Well, you, basically your call center reps are more important than your customers and you treat them that way. Because what happens is the, the amount of time that, you know, all this efficiency that's being gained inside the company is being outsourced to the customers. And we know that, right, as customers. It's like, okay, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna hunt down on Google, try and solve this problem. I can't solve it on Google. Uh, I got work to do today. I don't have time for this. I don't have an hour to get on the phone to resolve this problem. They don't measure that. <laughs> We don't call them because they're such hell to deal with. They have no internal measure for that, right? We go elsewhere. They don't measure that either. Finally, when they lose us to another company, something clicks, and then they start sending us mail, right? Brochures and offers in the mail. What is that? How does this work in a connected company? You call in, and you have a person who owns you who owns your problem. They have a platform, so they can access stuff, but they can also access people. What happens in a connected company is it, they don't bounce you to other people. If they need to call in somebody else, like say from fraud or from some other department, they just conference them in. It's a conference call. 
How hard is that? <laughs> and yet, we think, so, so from the corporate, businesses are a lot dumber than the people who work in them, right? We know that. The company itself is dumb. The people might be smart, but the system doesn't let them be smart, right? We think it's more efficient to bounce one person around to 15 people to solve a problem than to just have one little conference call. We do that a lot with email and businesses, right, as well. We do things to, in, in the idea of being efficient that are actually less efficient. Any of you here have heard of Ashby's Law? It comes out of cybernetics it's a, relative to dealing with complexity. So it's called the law of requisite variety. And what it means, it, what it says is basically that a control system has to have as many possible states as the system that it wants to control. And I think of this as a juggler, right? I can juggle, I can't juggle. I would if I could. But if I could juggle, I could probably juggle at three or four balls, right? At some point, too many balls, I will not be able to keep them in the air. That's just the law of requisite variety. Now, I can either, there are two ways to deal with that. One is to reduce the number of balls, so that's to reduce the variety in the external environment. And one is to increase the number of jugglers, just bring out more people so we can juggle more balls, okay? Now, from a business perspective, let me show you the, what this looks like. McDonald's, drive through Good job of reducing variety, right? We are essentially in a production line. We go in, order by number, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna go into, walk into a McDonald's and sit down and wait for a waiter to show up. It's not gonna, not gonna happen. They have trained us. Their business model is built and trained around reducing variety. There's only so many things you can do. There's only one way to go through the drive-through, et cetera. Right? They're reducing variety. Absorbing variety is something like a company like Nordstrom. If you know here in the U.S., Nordstrom is a company that uh, is very, or maybe Apple retail, you know, where the, the person who's in the store has a lot of flexibility and autonomy in the way that they solve user uh, problems of the customer. So people are really good at absorbing variety, really good, like a waiter. And if you think about this as a sort of a front stage, backstage, this is a concept from service design. In any business, you need to do both. You need to absorb variety, you need to reduce variety. But a, a good metaphor, a good way to think about this is on what they call the front stage in service design is like the area where you want to absorb as much variety as possible. So think about it like the front part of a restaurant where the waiter people come in and they want to get waited on and they're going to order off the menu or they have a crying baby or whatever. The organization is designed to absorb variety, to be able to have a, a waiter or a waitress be able to solve problems and, and do things, have a lot of flexibility. In the backstage, it's more like the kitchen. You can organize the kitchen for efficiency, more like a factory. You have certain things and you have the processes and the way that things go, and everyone can learn that stuff and you can operate more like a, more like a closed system in the backstage. And so I think, you know, if you think about it, um, this is another concept, I don't know if we wanna go in from, from, uh, from uh, architecture, but not everything changes at the same rate. So things that change really slowly are good candidates for the backstage because you can plan for it. You know, like Amazon, for example, uh, can be pretty confident that the way that packages are actually shipped and the way that logistics is managed and the way that warehouses are managed is not gonna change as rapidly as what happens on their front stage, which is there uh, on the website, right? So if you organize to, to, to absorb variety on your front stage, you're gonna organize differently than if you wanna reduce it on the backstage. Making sense? Okay. So pods are kind of some, like services, they're designed to absorb a lot of variety, to be able to adapt to a lot of different situations. And platforms are designed to reduce variety. And this is where the strategy comes in. What part of your business are things gonna change more slowly that you want, might wanna reduce variety and simplify put in your rules and so forth, what's possible, what's not possible, and what areas are you ex don't know what to expect, so you gotta be ready for rapid change. I don't need to explain service orientation to any of you, so I'll skip this part. Um, but the thought I wanna give you is, businesses are gonna reorganize around these principles. The same way that you've reorganized technology around these principles, 
The businesses are going to have to do it because there's no better way that we know of today to handle the kind of complexity that companies are going to have to handle. I don't need to explain this, but I'll give you an example from a company perspective. Whole Foods markets. You go into Whole Foods here in San Francisco, and you're going to have a whole different set of stuff than you're going to get in a Whole Foods in St. Louis, where I live. Now, it's still going to be a Whole Foods, but it's all going to be locally sourced, and that is a company that is designed to uh, be extremely customized to the markets that it's in. So the way they do it is very service-oriented. They have uh, a deli team, and the deli team can order from local vendors whatever they want, and uh, so the, that the teams in the store make up a store team. And all the stores together make up a region team. And all the regions together make up the company team, and that's the team that manages the company, runs the company. So it's kind of a hierarchy of services. Rational, anyone here know Rational Software? Now part of IBM? Rational was organized like this. If you, you know, the way uh, a lot of technology companies are still organized, you have, the sale, uh, you have what they call the liars, which are the salespeople, come in and make the promises, and they're all, kind of together in a sales team. And then the, uh, this is the customer perspective. So first we get the liars who come in and promise us everything and uh, tell us everything's gonna be wonderful. And then the liars go away and then the assholes come in. <laughs> Excuse my language. And the assholes are the ones who are gonna, they're measured on profitability. So they're like, I don't, you know, I need to do, I need to go change orders, I need to do change requests, blah, 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 blah. Now, well, the way Rational was organized was they shared a common fate. So any team was like a pod. You'd have the sales in there, you'd have the, uh, the developers in there. And they would go in as a pod, and they would map, they would be, so the salesperson could not make a promise that they weren't gonna you know, keep because they, were, they had a common fate as a pod. They, they lived and died as a group. And the people that I talked to, I interviewed at Rational, uh, who were at Rational, uh, for many of them say it was the best time in their lives. It was the best time they had, and many of them are also CEOs now of their own companies, partly because you learn a lot about a business by operating in a podular way as well. Amazon, um, I don't think I probably need to explain this, very service-oriented, small teams, um, all that stuff aggregated, coming together on the web page when you and I go and visit Amazon, it's all collectively, it's developed all massively parallel, all at the same time, that stuff's a big service ecosystem, and many of those things being exposed to the public as services now. Morningstar, anyone heard of Morningstar? They make tomato paste. <laughs> they turn tomatoes into tomato paste. It's not really that complicated, but they have a service-oriented uh, architecture is the way they run their business. Every single employee, uh, once a year, creates their service contracts with their suppliers and the people that they get the stuff from that they need to do their job and the people that they're their internal customers that they deliver the stuff to. They organize all around service oriented principles. And it's the biggest tomato paste company in the, in the country, so they're doing something right. Um, what does this mean for leaders? Um, leaders are gonna have to lead. <laughs> they're not gonna be spending so much time looking at reports of stuff moving back and forth. They're going to have to go to the front line. They're going, what, hap what powers a connected company is the stories and the cross-pollination that happens when things from one pod are shared with another pod, right? So uh, this is my picture of you know, that customer employee weather front that I was talking about before where the edge leader is pollinating you know, going around the front lines, trying to understand what's going on and helping to share that information across. This is gonna be really uncomfortable for a lot of senior people who probably are, would be terrified at the idea of talking to a customer. Right? So, how to begin. This is where I think WSO2 has some really great stuff. Best there is, as far as I can tell. Best there is. First thing is, if you're in a large company and you're structured in this kind of old-fashioned way, like a watch, 
you want to start by asking one question. Very, well, probably the most important question, a hard one to ask, hard one to even consider. How would you reinvent your company as a startup today? I mean, if you were starting from scratch and you wanted to be able to handle this kind of complexity, you're going to start, you're going to reinvent the entire company, General Electric, as a startup. What would you do? How would you do that? What is it that you do, and how would you think about that? And that's, a, that's what a pod would be. That's a pod. Now, that could be an experiment. And how do you design, how do you put a pod together? This is the, let's assume that this is the organization you live in. Looks familiar, right? Sadly. There's this thing called draw the kidney. You take that, all the people that are involved in delivering one piece of value to a customer, one chunk of value, they're not going to be in the same team, right? They're going to be handoffs. They're actually going to be people who are used to this, like pointing fingers at each other and blaming each other for this and that going wrong, right? They don't share. That's because they don't share a common fate. They don't report to the same people. They don't report to the same customer. So they can all blame each other all day long. And we see that, right? Draw the kidney. Put those people in a pod together. Give them a common fate. Give them a customer or a set of customers that they're going to be working with. Trust me, customers will be thrilled. The internal people will probably fight this at first. So think about a pilot pod. Now, where a lot of uh, these kind of initiatives have failed is because they unintentionally hamper the, the pod by making it use the existing platform in the company that was designed for something completely different. So there's a couple of airlines, I can't remember, TED was one, right? United, we're going to compete with Southwest. We got TED, because all we need is a happy name, and it'll be a happy airline. What happened with TED? Remember TED, anyone? Balloons in the airport, Ooh, welcome to TED. What happened was, TED was forced to use the existing reservation systems, all the stuff, all the, and the, idea, the thinking is kind of logical, right? Well, we already have this stuff built. Just use the stuff we already have, and we'll just put a new you know, smiley face on top. But that doesn't work, right? We know why, do we know why it doesn't work? It doesn't work because a startup doesn't have all that baggage. It doesn't have all the assumptions that are built into that legacy infrastructure are death to a startup. The startup needs to be able to build its own platform. The startup needs to be able to figure out what it wants. And this is where I think WSO2 is so powerful because it gives you a way to do that. When I wrote the book, I didn't know about WSO2, um, and I didn't have the answer to this question of how do you start to build a platform for something that's completely new? WSO2 is the answer to that, though. You can, you can just pick the pieces that you want, identity management, whatever, plug them in, you can start plugging them in as you want them and build your own custom platform very easily. And with a single code base, you can, you can pretty much do anything you want there. It's ultimately, it's like the ultimate fantasy for someone who's trying to build a connected company. Um, now, you don't have to only do one experiment. You can have just like a lean startup. Think about that pilot pod as like a lean startup. You can have 15 different experiments or more. And what that allows you to do is you can actually learn a lot. There's something called emergent strategy. There's a guy named Henry Mintzberg who talks about this. You can, you can actually have lots of different hypotheses about how the company might grow, and you can try them all. It's actually not that expensive, right? Think about where do most startups come from? They come from people inside of big companies who have great ideas, who couldn't get, couldn't, couldn't figure out a way to do that within the resources of a billion dollar company. They couldn't do it. So they go off with, with no money and they do it. Why? Well, these billions of dollars of resources are just not organized in such a way that they can, I mean, think about how silly that is, really. I'd rather quit and do my startup because the billion dollar company 
is not a resource, it's a constraint. And here we are, and all the people at the top are saying, we want more creativity, we want more innovation, we need more innovation, we need more innovation. But what happens when all the ideas are inside the company that need to have, that the company needs to be innovative, they're constrained though, for the most part. Now, the enlightened company can do this, and it's pretty cheap, right? We all know that. It's cheaper now than it ever has been in the past in the history of uh, our planet. So I think we have some time for questions, if you have any. Oh, uh, let me just say, there's a book out there for everyone. If you want one, grab it. And if you'd like me to sign it, either to you or to your boss or to your customer or someone who you think needs to hear this story more than you do, I will sign it to them. So thank you very much. Want to do questions? I really like your build the kidney idea. Um, we're actually seeing that in real time where you have component groups within major companies who are working with us on the startup development end, and they're kind of in an endless vapor lock mode where why would we rearrange a team to solve a problem for you? Uh, so my question is, do you have an uh, example of a company who's been able to build the kidney and repod their employees to be successful? Yeah, I mean, I, anecdotally, I wasn't there for it, but uh, I interviewed someone, uh, um, and apparently John Deere has done this, where they had, um, you know, they basically were, in a situation where they almost had no choice. I mean, there was kind of a back to the wall situation. And this was a move of, you know, kind of urgency. Uh, but, and I do think that helps, of course. But uh, they were able to do something like this. And that's where I got the term draw the kidney from. It was like the guy who, who does it there talked about, well, you know, we have to draw the kidney. And that's how we built it. And there, I think there, there was another part of that initiative, which was very much around uh, customer empathy. So there was a lot of um, the guy who was sort of uh, led that transformation or was a part of it. Um, the story that he told me was uh, he went he went back at various points in this transformation, and one of the biggest differences he saw in the actual office was sticky notes and uh, lots of stuff on the walls that were helping people collaboratively really think about customers and really think about them holistically. And so there's, I think there's something culturally about flipping a switch to really making the customer, it wasn't like people didn't care about customers before, but they hadn't made it real and tangible and created you know, photographs and things and put things on the wall and really started to think about the customer as the thing they were building the solution around. It, it was more of a, probably more of a factory type orientation before. So I think um, I, if you, uh, I can try and connect you with the guy who was, who's involved in that if you want to have a more direct conversation. I don't have a lot of the details on it. Anyone else? Thoughts about like, you know, uh, think about, I mean, think about going to the people in your organization that need to hear this story and maybe channel some of their questions if you can. Yeah. You talked a lot about the platform, but I was also intrigued in one slide you had the organizing principles. Can you talk a little bit more about the difference between yeah, sure. Shows. Yeah, so uh, uh, the, the most winningest companies have a, usually a very beautiful and clear kind of theory of organization. Not only that's clear within the company, but it's clear to their customers. So, so Southwest Airlines, for example, it's everywhere in the company there's a theory of how it works, right? We are, we are friendly, you know, for example, uh, one of the rules, most airlines have very strict procedures. They're sort of built on this kind of military model where, and you know, you get, you get the feeling when people are reading from a script to you, you know, in the airline, right? Their, their eyes are dead. Uh, when it comes to uh, having a request, right, what happens in most airlines is not allowed, can't do that, sorry, but the, you know, you don't get this real feeling they're, they're sorry, you feel like, actually you get the feeling that they're trapped in a awful, terrible system that they hate, right? Now, 
Southwest Airlines, for example, has a, a, a kind of an opposite principle. Instead of towing the line and going along the process and having to follow a procedure, if you're a flight attendant on, on Southwest, the rule is uh, do whatever you think is right to serve the customer. If you start to feel uncomfortable or think like it's out of bounds, that's when you check with a supervisor. So there's a, there's a principle there. Instead of a procedure or kind of a process, there's a set of principles that are like, kind of like heuristics or guidelines. Um, Amazon ha has a great, very top level, highest level domain. What are the things that we do? We obsess over customers. Um, we invent, and there's one other, <laughs> escapes me at the moment. But there's like basically three very high level, arc kind of architectural principles that when in doubt, you can refer back to. Okay. We obsess over customers. We're going to obsess over customers. Oh, yeah, the, the second one is that they, they have a long-term view, the third one. So Amazon will never manage their business results quarter to quarter. They will, they will have a, take a long view on stuff. It doesn't mean that they won't kill things. I mean, anyone remember Amazon auctions? That was an experiment. It was a good one. But Amazon, I saw a talk where Jeff Bezos was speaking about this, and he said, well, we figured out, actually, that's not our customer. Our customer doesn't want to wait. <laughs> you know, they're, our customer doesn't want to wait. They want to see what they get, want buy it, get it. Okay, so we're obsessing about customers. Our customers, we not only did we have an experiment and say that it failed, we actually learned something. Well, what did we learn? Amazon also will treat, uh, you know, customer, any customer contact as a defect. So Amazon's thinking, okay, if they had to call us, it's not just we're going to have a person answer and solve the problem. We do want to do that. But we're then going to do a little root cause analysis. We're going to figure out, okay, why did they have to, call, why did they have to contact us? There's something wrong. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, feel free to come uh, contact me. And uh, if you want me to sign a book over to you or someone else, I'm happy to do it. A big stack of them out there. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get that for you. Okay. Great, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, with that, we go into a quick break. Uh, soon after the break, you will hear from the dub from WSO2's VP of Solutions Architecture and a senior product manager from Boeing. Now I know you're going to come on time. See you at 3:30. <laughs> 